live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of the Inside Scoop. I am your guest host today, uh, Delegate Marcus Simon. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about something that I think a lot of people have on their mind uh, at the end of the year. And as you go into a new year, you know, we, we have a lot of people that make New Year's resolutions uh, to lose weight. Uh, but also, I think some of us to, to sort of set a new budget, right, to figure out uh, how much money we have coming in and going out. And frankly, uh, with the pandemic that, that we're all living through, um, you know, sometimes we've had to change our budget. Uh, and for some people, depending on what kind of work you do, um, if you're you know, in the right field, you maybe have made more money than you did in the past. But for a lot of people, uh, you're trying to figure out how to do more with less. Or maybe you're finding you're surprised at how much money you have left at the end of each month. Uh, because you're not spending money going out to eat as much. And, and it's maybe maybe you decide to uh, reevaluate uh, your priorities, your spending priorities, to look at where your revenue can come from, to look for ways to supplement your income uh, so that if things go bad again, uh, you've got some more savings. So just like all of you, the viewers out there watching us today, uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia does this process every year too. Well, kind of every year. Uh, and joining us today to talk about uh, Virginia's budget process, where we are in it at the end of 2020 and going into 2021. Um, you know, the decisions that we as a Commonwealth have to make in the General Assembly, um, setting the budget policy with the governor for the Commonwealth, the decisions that are facing uh, Virginia, uh, given that we're living in a pandemic, given that our revenues have been affected and that the needs to spend have changed a lot. So joining us to talk about all of that uh, is Michael Cassidy. Uh, Michael is the president and CEO of the Commonwealth Institute for Fiscal Analysis. Um, the CFI, uh, as we call it, provides um, strategic management to achieve the organization's goals of a more prosperous Virginia. I'm just reading that right off their website. Um, <laughs> and greater economic opportunity for all Virginians. But I will let Michael probably do a much better job than I could just reading it off the website, telling us a little bit. Let's start with, tell us a little bit about what the Commonwealth Institute is. Uh, what your mission is and, and what kind of work you do around uh, the General Assembly uh, to further that mission. Sure thing. Well, thanks, Marcus, for having me on tonight to talk about this really important issue about the state budget choices that Virginia faces. Uh, so yeah, the Commonwealth Institute for Fiscal Analysis is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. And our work really is to advance economic and racial justice in Virginia by advocating for public policies that are shaped by credible, accessible, and timely analysis of these issues. So we do a lot of work around the state budget. We do a lot of work around what's happening in the economy, what's happening with jobs, what's happening with wages. Uh, we look at issues like education funding, um, uh, immigration, uh, and, uh, and we also take a look at where does Virginia have the resources to make those public investments. And so we do a lot of work on tax policy in areas like that. Uh, we were started in 2006, so we're celebrating our 15th anniversary in 2021. And uh, so we have a whole team of analysts uh, who are deeply skilled at analyzing uh, data and information and public policies. Uh, we also have a team of folks who are very skilled at communications and how you coordinate different advocacy efforts to advance policy proposals and different initiatives. Um, and uh, so it's really it's really kind of our bread and butter issue to talk about these issues. So thank you so much for having me on. Uh, absolutely. No, thanks for joining me. I mean, the budget uh, in Virginia can be a pretty dense um, document to look through. And so you guys provide some tools uh, for members of the General Assembly. And I'm always happy to have it. Tell us a little bit about the some of the the the, the tools you try and provide legislators just basically to, so that we can all sort of be up to speed on what's going on in the budget. Sure. So one of the key mantras for our work is is uh, to provide accessible information and analysis. And um, especially because, as you say, the, the budget process can be a really opaque one. It can be a bit of a rocket docket and things move very fast, especially once uh, different versions of the budget come out of the budget committees. Uh, so one of the key uh, uh, tools that we provide to lawmakers um, and to others like the press and other advocates is we do very detailed uh, but uh, top line kind of summary of the budget. Um, and we put out something that we call our budget side by side that compares major uh, 
provisions in the budget proposals as it moves through the process. Um, so we are busily doing that right now for the version that of the budget that the governor introduced uh, the um, um, on December uh, 16th. Uh, and, uh, and then as that budget proposal moves through the legislative process, we produce updated versions of that document to compare what the House um, has done, what the Senate's doing, um, what floor action looks like. And then of course, at the end of the process, the two chambers come together uh, for a conference committee. Um, and uh, that's a really valuable tool for legislators because you're making very important decisions on votes on the budget. But if you aren't on those budget committees, um, you maybe haven't seen the details of it until it too is released publicly. And it's really important to have that information, to be able to have apples to apples comparisons of things so you can understand what are the differences and nuances between the approaches for the budget that the House has taken versus the Senate and uh, those kinds of things. And we also have a blog that we uh, very actively produce um, uh, short pieces through our blog called The Half Sheet to, um, to weigh in and lift up information and findings and analysis on key legislation or key areas that are being debated in the budget. And so all this is part and parcel of contributing to the conversation, um, really lifting up uh, the key uh, trade-offs and um, things that are happening in the budget, particularly with a focus on how they affect middle class and low income folks in our state um, and together become the uh, uh, some of the sort of signature products of, of TCI and the work of our team uh, during the legislative session. Yeah, and that stuff, I guess, like you said, it's available to anybody. I mean, legislators certainly find it very useful, but yeah. members of the public, I know that, that, that um, we've got a lot of people that have become very interested in advocacy uh, more so than ever since 2016. We got a lot of yeah. sort of newly uh, awoken um, folks who realized that that uh, you know government and politics and policy is not a spectator sport, and if you don't uh, participate, you, you you can't complain. And we got a lot of people that would like to complain lately. So uh, either, in a good way, right? I mean, yeah. you, you get involved and get involved before things become a problem. Uh, so part of the tell us a lot. Back up a little bit. The tools are great and I understand, but I think to understand why you need a tool like this, um, I think it's it's worth spending a little bit of time explaining our budget process in Virginia. So as I sort of said at the outset, at the beginning of each year, we look at our budget, but it's, it's not the same way every year, right? We have a, a, a biennial budget. And right. so talk a little bit about how that part of the process works in Virginia. Sure. So Virginia, like many other states, operates off of a two-year budget. And so, as you said, that's technically called a biennial budget. And so the General Assembly um, enacts a budget um, that covers then two um, state fiscal years. Um, that's typically done um, in the um, even uh, numbered years during our long sessions of 60-day uh, sessions. And then historically, the off year, the short session, uh, would be just minor amendments to that budget. Um, back in the day, uh, those amendments were really quite modest. Um, they would be things really only reflecting perhaps new federal dollars that had come down or some, uh, let's say, uh, court decision had come out that affected the way that we were implementing or running a program. However, as Virginia has continued to grow as a Commonwealth, as our economy has grown, as our population has grown, as the way that we fund public services um, has continued to, uh, to grow and evolve, um, the General Assembly ends up making a significant amount of amendments uh, to that budget. Uh, so it first starts with a uh, proposal by the governor that is typically released uh, the week before Christmas, uh, where the governor lays out his uh, budget proposal. And that document actually becomes the legislation uh, that the uh, General Assembly then considers in their own deliberations. Um, that becomes the bills themselves. Um, not every state does it that way, but here in Virginia, that governor's proposal is that starting point and the chairman, chairs of the uh, what we affectionately call the money committees um, carry those bills regardless of what party uh, they're in or the party of, of the governor. Um, and then it's in the legislature's uh, lap to then uh, deal with. You know, uh, the old saying is that the governor proposes, but the General Assembly disposes of 
of um, uh, proposed uh, budgets. And so the power of the purse that that is what the General Assembly holds is a really key responsibility of lawmakers. And so during those um, early weeks of the General Assembly, the money committee uh, members and their staffs uh, are digging deeply into what was in the governor's proposal. Um, the comparing it to members' priorities, comparing it to um, other um, key initiatives that um, are being proposed. And that then forms the basis of the General Assembly's um, uh, action on the governor's budget, which comes out a little after midpoint in the session. Um, and they put, you all put your stamp on it. And then the normal process is, of course, there's differences between the way the House and the Senate will approach that. And those bills will then go into conference. The budget is often among the last uh, bills that are debated during a session. And so uh, uh, quite regularly, the budget is uh, either a full budget or amendments to the budget are dealt with on or near the last day of session. Um, and that's sort of a normal year. Now, of course, this has not been a normal year. So we could talk about all the roller coaster ride of this year, but that's sort of the, the normal process around how Virginia uh, builds and enacts a budget. The one other thing I'd note that's really strange about our system is, as I mentioned, it's a two-year budget, but of course we have a one-term governorship. And so it's a little unusual in our state that uh, Virginia governors only have one budget that they propose uh, and see through to enactment, which is um, a little bit unusual. Um, and, uh, and it's kind of where our two-year budget and our one-term governor kind of intersect in that way. Well, I think it's interesting also just the way that the cycle has worked. I mean, you know, I, I'm not sure when we got on this particular biennial budget, but the way it, we could make it so there was a little more overlap, right? right. Um, but but we've kind of got it, and it is interesting. It's a sort of a parting shot as the departing governor leaves, but, it, but it's also you know, out of necessity. He's got, he, he runs the agencies the, 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 all year long, you need to tell them what the, the needs are and what the expenses are and, and make their proposals. And, and he, he runs the executive branch agencies that kind of develop the underlying you know, premises for these budgets. Right. Um, have you noticed any difference, uh, I mean, before we get to the specifics of what's happening in 2020 and 2021, um, since the, uh, you know, for, since, since the governorship and the um, legislature are now in the same hand, right? This is our first time we have the, the, the trifecta. And I yeah. think that there was probably, maybe this is a better question for, for one of the, 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 the appropriators, but just your observation from the outside. Um, yeah, I remember when Chris Jones would get the budget from Terry McAuliffe, he essentially would say that it wouldn't say quite say dead on arrival, but he'd be like, okay, thanks for the suggestions. Thanks for sort of the outline. Yeah. But you know, now, you know, the Republican state legislature is going to really put our imprimatur on this budget and, and, and we're going to do what we believe we need to do. And so, you know, in many cases, the budget amendment that came from the legislature really kind of ate the whole thing. And that was really what it was all about. Uh, has it been any different so far with a Democratic governor or the, 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 have you found that the, the legislature wants to sort of flex its independence as a separate branch of government? Yeah, I think on some of the big issues, there always is, regardless of party, you know, the General Assembly wants to weigh in. And that's been consistent, um, you know, big signature um, initiatives, um, the way that the General Assembly is going to want to shape them can differ from a governor regardless of party. I think also it's important to remember just the different institutional um, pressures, cross currents um, are really relevant here. You know, a governor has their priorities that they're trying to advance. Uh, they want to put that budget together uh, so it can advance them and so that that it's in balance, right? They always propose a, a balanced budget. And so that's always, the, and so that's, um, uh, uh, always a key part. Then when it moves over to the legislative arena, um, you all have uh, different dynamics at play, right? You have member priorities. Uh, you have um, to keep the budget in balance as well, but the, the how you thread together those member priorities um, can differ from what the governor may do. And so I think that's also just an institutional force that's at play, regardless of the party uh, uh, differences or similarities. Uh, uh, and I think that's important. There was a really uh, good analysis done several years ago by uh, uh, a former uh, Virginia chief of staff who really looked in detail and, and the, um, the General Assembly uh, approves about 80% of a governor's budget over time uh, on the operating side um, and they change about 20% of it. 
On the capital side, the numbers are inversed. It's it, the the General Assembly typically makes big, bigger changes to to capital proposals. You know, what are we doing in terms of building and and projects and those sorts of things? Um, and so the, there's sort of that trend over time. Yeah, and that makes some sense. I mean, I suspect on some level you've got to kind of trust the agencies to tell you what their what their operating needs are, and they 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 have so much more information uh, than yeah. we do as legislators. Although capital stuff, stuff we can you know, almost always get our, our head around. Yeah, um, exactly. And where we like to build things, right? Monuments to ourselves. So, <laughs> um, the, uh, so yeah, that's, yeah, the other, uh, on that point, I mean, the other time, sometimes you'll see uh, in the governor's budget proposal, and this year in particular is one where you can see some signals about what the governor's legislative priorities are gonna be. And if, you know, you know there are bill ideas floating around, uh, it's always a good sign to see it's already funded in the budget. Uh, for instance, um, you know, we're talking about expanding the Court of Appeals in Virginia uh, because uh, for a variety of policy reasons, none of which, frankly, are, are the reasons uh, that, um, you know, that Republicans are talking about. This is nothing like a federal court packing thing because our Court of Appeals doesn't do, they don't hear those kind of cases. There's nothing politically charged, frankly, about what they do. You know, they, they, they hear contract disputes, they hear criminal appeals. Well, and then so that's what we're going to talk about. It's giving you know, a greater uh, jurisdiction to a court, of, a court of appeals. We actually have an intermediate level between circuit courts and the Supreme Court. At any rate, you know, it's a big deal. It's a big ask and it costs a lot of money. Um, and so, you know, everybody's like, yeah, it's a great idea. Everybody, every, again, if you take the politics out of it, most people think it's a good idea. The question is, can we, can we afford it? And so when you see that the governor's included money for, you know, another five new, uh, you know, court of appeals justices, that, that's a signal from the governor that, hey guys, go ahead and, and, figure out this policy and what you need to do to make it happen because I found a way uh, to pay for it. Um, so it's always, like I said, there's, there's some oh, yeah. things in there that tell you, give you, know, give you some signals. Uh, I think last year uh, when there was funding for uh, a, a minimum wage increase, for instance, right. um, that was a signal from the governor's office, go ahead and send me something up uh, and I'm likely to sign it because I've actually put it in my budget. That's right, exactly. And because, um, and from an advocacy standpoint, when you think about folks in your community who are, um, you know, engaged on advocating for different issues um, across the board, what have you, it is always a huge advantage if that initiative that you and your community members are advocating for can make its way into the governor's budget. Because if it doesn't, um, then um, when they're advocating with the General Assembly, you all are left then with the challenge of saying, okay, how do we make room for this other initiative and what are we gonna take out, right? What are we gonna cut, what are we gonna change? Um, or, you know, where are we gonna find the revenue for it, what have you? And so those dynamics are different. And so it definitely, the grids are, the, the skids are definitely greased when something uh, has uh, a place that's already there in the budget. Um, and that can, that can uh, play in very different ways. You know, I remember, uh, vividly uh, sitting in the House Appropriations Committee uh, room uh, in the first session after Tim Kaine had left office and Governor Bob McDonnell was now in office. And so uh, just before our governors leave office, they introduce the next two year budget and they leave. And of course, pre-K, uh, uh, pre-kindergarten had been a huge initiative under Tim Kaine's administration. And I remember sitting in that appropriations room and all of these members uh, for the Republican uh, members of the caucus were coming up with their different budget amendments and their proposals. And every one of them used the money that Governor Kane had put in for the pre-K program as their offset for their, for their initiative, you know? So he had made, he had made room in the budget for that pre-K work, but they were, uh, they were going to be trying to take it out uh, to make room for their priorities. Yeah. Yeah. That happens. Um, so um, this year, it's been a different kind of a year, as, as you were saying. Yeah. Um, and I know that the, the budget for 20, the, this, this particular, this December 16th budget for our, really the amendments to our biennial budget have just come out. But this is actually almost basically our, our, our third, maybe I, I think it was sort of our third bite at the apple. Can right. you talk a little bit about what, um, sure. you know, so, so we pass our budget, uh, you know, as you said, one of the last things we did in 2020 in March, right. uh, we adopted a biennial budget at the beginning of March. Uh, and we had heard about this sort of interesting disease that was happening in China that caused them to sort of close their, their Lunar New Year yeah. and that things were starting to get bad in places like Italy. Uh, but we didn't really know much until, right. again, about that middle week of March. And, and so 
talk a little bit of sure. you know, I'll give you a little more detail for on the process. So the, the between March and April, so the gut the, the General Assembly, you know, we passed that bill at the end of March. Uh, and then in April, we come back for what's called a reconvened session. Um, and we consider the governor's amendment. So so governor gives us a budget, we amend it, give it send it back to the governor. He's got six weeks to amend our amendments, right? And tell right. us what you know, all right, nice try here, but let's try this. And then we come back for a reconvened session to 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 really adopt that budget um and, and sort out the differences between the legislature and the governor. So what how did we deal with the fact that there was a pandemic this year? We had a bunch of new spending that we thought was gonna be great, and then all of a sudden we were worried there'd be no revenue left. So talk exactly. a little bit about that. Yeah, it really was quite a roller coaster ride because uh, you had there were significant um, new investments made in the uh, two year budget that was adopted um, during the regular session. And as you mentioned, the timing was uh, really quite um, challenging because uh, the session um, ended. Uh, the budget was adopted on Thursday, March 12th. And that was the same day that the uh, governor declared a state of emergency. Um, and so immediately things shifted. And so especially when we have the dynamics like we do now, where the General Assembly is um, controlled by the same party as the governor, you would not typically expect much in the way of, of, of changes in that amendment process that you talked about, the, 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 the month or so that the bills are all sitting on the governor's desk for, for action. Uh, but instead, because of the calamitous situation that was happening with the lockdown and going into quarantine, um, the governor sent down a, a mountain of amendments uh, to the budget uh, to essentially freeze uh, those new investments. Um, at the same time, the uh, federal government um, in Congress had begun, beca begun acting and passing uh, some of those early uh, relief bills like the CARES Act and others. And so there were also significant amendments to deal with um, those new federal funds. And so when you all came back in April uh, for just the typical one day uh, reconvened veto session, there was actually a significant amount of action that was done on the budget. And that was highly, highly unusual. Um, and basically uh, what you all decided to do was to, and what he had proposed was to freeze those new investments. Um, and we all got to, uh, those of us who were budget geeks knew this term, but the but many many more people got to learn the budget term of unallotting um, of of uh, state investments because uh, it takes three things for public investments to occur: the state has to have the money, it has to the general assembly has to appropriate it, and it has to be then allotted to the agencies to go ahead and spend. And that's the part that every that was frozen. Um, then when the special session was called that began in middle of August, that then provided an opportunity for the General Assembly um, and the governor to take uh, further action on the state budget and to refine things again, especially because uh, you know by that time, um, things had shifted um, and uh, in terms of uh, how we were managing through the pandemic and some of the really dire economic numbers of those first few weeks had started to shift a bit more. And so during the special session that then was um, conducted in the late summer and into the fall, um, a significant amount of, of changes were made as well, um, including uh, going ahead and, and unfreezing um, uh, many of those important new investments across a host of areas. Got it. And it looks like we have been joined uh, by um, Delegate Mark Sickles. Uh, Hi, how it, the uh, I think the the 2020 version of stuck in traffic is I got the wrong <laughs> link um, or I'm having uh, Wi-Fi issues. But at any rate, uh, he's with us now. Uh, and Mark, uh, just to catch you up, uh, we're, we're we're closing up the first half of the show now. We'll we'll we'll, we'll have you do catch you up. Trust me, I'll give you plenty of time in the second half. We mostly been talking process with Michael about how Virginia's budget process works. That we're a two-year biennial budget. Uh, that uh, you know, in, the, in these off years, we typically deal with um, just amendments to the governor's budget. Although over time, the the, the amendments have become you know more and more broader and broader in scope and more substantive even during the off years. So it almost feels like we're doing a new budget every year. I think we just finished talking about what we went through uh, with the unallotment process um, during the uh, during during the reconvene session. 
So once we figured out what we couldn't spend, we just came, we, we, as Michael was saying, we came back and we restored a bunch of that spending. Um, and when we come back from the break um, in, in a couple minutes, we'll, we will go ahead and, um, and, and let Mark fill us in on, from an appropriator's point of view on what we did. Um, and then we'll talk to both of you guys about what we, what, what we have left to do uh, in, in 2021, um, you know, based on what the governor sort of proposed for us. Um, I know that, uh, Michael, how, how would you describe the, the as far as the, politically, I know you guys are you know, research-based and, and evidence-based, but would it be fair to say that you guys come from sort of a left of center position on a lot of these issues? Yeah, I mean, we believe in the value of public investments and the need to have programs and services that that support middle class and low income families. And so that's definitely our mindset around what our values that we bring into these conversations. Gotcha. Yeah. So like I said, we'll get some of that perspective. Uh, and then, you know, um, we don't have anybody from the far right, you know, so it, which is good. I think, yeah, I don't know that we need to hear those. We know what those those uh, solutions typically are, which is just cut taxes and, and that's that. Um, so um, the the uh, I think we are going to be we're right at the point probably where we want to bring Mark back, uh, but we're almost out of time for this half. But Mark, in two minutes, sort of just if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself. So when we come back for the second half, we can dive straight into the um, the budget. You've been in the General Assembly since two thousand and four. Is that right? Two thousand and four. So this is what this is now your sixteenth year. Eight, this is my eight, mess, I'm just finishing seventeenth year, seventeenth year, seven, and um, yeah, I've I've been doing this appropriation thing for about seven years, ever since Bob Brink left, and um, it's been a real ride to learn how to do it with in the Republican majority. And then now for the last twelve months, we're in charge, so it's kind of scary trying to get <laughs> trying to get everything right. And there's a lot of choices to make, and in my in my area, uh, particularly the healthcare space, uh, it's it's twenty four percent of what we do. And it's very complicated. It's more complicated, I have to say, than any of the other subcommittees. And that's because the programs are just convoluted and we we do them in partnership with the federal government. And it's, uh, you know, uh, a lot of time we have not done a, a great job over the years, as Michael will attest, to bringing down federal dollars. I mean, they pay for most programs, they pay a dollar if we pay a dollar. And uh, so we've left a lot of money on the table. And we're, we're trying to uh, get ourselves out of a settlement agreement with the federal government on how we uh, take care of our intellectually disabled community. We've been working on that for some time, but the real crisis that uh, the public wants us to get at now, I think, is a mental health issue, serious mental illness. And we do not have uh, comprehensive community services across the so state. Mark, we're gonna have very, to come, very spotty. We're gonna, okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm filibustering. No, no, you're, you're good. We're, we're going to have to come back uh, right after the break. Uh, okay. You'll hear more from Mark Sickles on, on all those issues. And Michael Cassie, you are watching the Inside Scoop. Even though there is so much against us. You will see me choose to protect myself and my community from the coronavirus by wearing a face cover. Because it's going to take all of us thinking about one another. And even with my face covered, you will see me. You will see me as a mother, a wife, a friend. As an athlete who gave everything to the game I love. As a father, leading by example. As a sister. An entertainer. As a champion for my people. You will see me finding a light in a dark time. To unlock our creativity and push our craft. You will see me demanding the space to tell the stories that matter. As a man who knows that tough times don't last, but tough people do. Join us in wearing a face covering to help stop the spread of the coronavirus. Because covering your face is one small act of kindness that has the power to bring us together. America, land of the free. It's at the core of who we are. Freedom. The freedom to live without fear. To drive through all 50 states. To sleep safely in our own beds. The freedom to jog where we please. To watch birds in the park. To wear a hoodie. The freedom to breathe. 
Before we celebrate the freedom most Americans have, we must fight for the freedom all Americans deserve. Because no matter your religion, gender, disability, age, race, all lives can't matter until black lives matter. fight against coronavirus isn't over. Let's wear face masks in public. Stay six feet or more from others. Follow state and local guidelines and wash our hands frequently. Let's move forward together. Learn more at coronavirus.gov. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. And welcome back to this week's edition of the Inside Scoop. Uh, today we're talking about end of the year budgeting and budget processes. Um, and we were just talking with Michael Cassidy, who's the president of the Commonwealth Institute, and my colleague, Mark Sickles, a uh, member of the House of Delegates who represents the uh, Springfield area, who's also our vice chair of appropriations, uh, about Virginia's budget process and how we kind of reevaluate our revenues and expenditures uh, and what we've been doing uh, this year in particular, uh, living through the pandemic. Like a lot of households, uh, our budget original, you know, best laid plans at the beginning of 2020 didn't come out anything like what we expected. Um, and so as a result, uh, we were just talking about the fact that we had a special session uh, just this fall, it really started in August and wound up uh, at the end of October, beginning of November. Uh, and Mark, you were uh, fairly involved in the, um, you know, the budget work that was done. You know, the, the special session got a lot of headlines uh, for police reform. We did a lot of very important police and criminal justice reforms, right. but it was really called um, as a budget session to take a look um, at, at what had happened to Virginia's revenues, uh, you know, the, the, as we closed out the books on the fiscal year uh, over the summer, what, what, what that had done to our, our revenues and, and how that would affect what we could spend money on. So, Mark, do you want to tell us a little bit about some of the highlights of the changes that we made uh, during the, uh, the special session? That sure. Did? Sure. Um, in the special session, we did put some money back that we had unallotted uh, in our um, a veto session in April 22nd, mo mostly in healthcare, all all COVID related things, including uh, backing up and giving some more flexibility to our K through 12 system, uh, uh, helping out the higher education system who took it in blows in several ways, including uh, uh, tuition is down, out of state students, which pay for two Virginia students not coming back to campus and just the uh, the loss of fees and revenues from sporting events, from uh, dining halls and in 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 residencies residences, and so all that uh, dormitories. So all that has hit them, and we help backfill some of that money. Uh, I've never been thanked so much as we as we were from our higher education uh, from our presidents. Um, on the healthcare side, we. We got involved in helping to direct the CRF money that came from the CARES Act uh, that Congress passed. That this money had a deadline on it. It's actually coming up right now, uh, December 30th. And uh, the administration had been waiting logically for uh, these uh, proposed or talked about, discussed um, second packages that would that would release the strings some of the strings that was on that money. And so they didn't spend a lot of it. We were very concerned that they would not be able to get the funds out the door in, by the December 30 deadline. Um, we had some very good uh, uses that weren't being spent. For instance, in the eviction money, the governor had allocated uh, $50 million for that. But then when we went into session on August 18, they'd only spent something like four to $5 million of it. They just couldn't get it done. So we revamped the program working with uh, industry. Um, and uh, now that money is really being spent uh, going out the door. Uh, we'll need more of that in the budget that the governor introduced yesterday for uh, the second year, mostly for the second year, starting July 1, but some for this, uh, this year that we're still in 2021. Uh, we'll go into that area to backfill that space. But um, so we, we just did a repair job. We we had a lot of people thanking us for what we did, and it, it really did help us get to this point. Uh, we didn't know that the revenues would continue to be this good. I mean, Virginia is very lucky. Our, our economic mix of very major, large employers 
uh, have helped us in the professional services area, area where a lot of folks work in these in these uh, companies could work at home. Uh, our sales tax revenue is up. Our transactions uh, uh, are up on real estate transactions because the people are buying bigger houses because their kids are home and looking for more space. And uh, and so uh, and taking advantage really, of record low interest rates too. I mean, record, that's my business. Absolutely. Yes, so absolutely. It's a big absolutely. incentive to buy real estate. Now, if you, if you have a job still, you can still work. You yeah. know, go buy the biggest house you can afford because, you, one, you need the space, and two, the money's never been cheaper. So Yeah, it is. It's really it's really good like that. And our in, we, Virginia's very dependent, and probably more so than other states. Michael could probably evaluate that on the, on the income tax. You know, we're very reliant on it. And we're a wealthy state. So we do have cash in the bank. We are concerned about um uh what happens if the bottom falls out and a couple of years ago because the way our rainy day fund works is that it's based on our revenue not being what the projection is so we used the rainy day fund earlier than wall street looking at our credit rating thought we should in previous years during the mcauliffe administration so we created a, a separate cash reserve fund that's easier to get to and uh you don't have to jump through so many hoops or wait until the uh, the criteria that's in the Constitution are met, and so uh, we, that has keep that's keeping us a good financial position. And the governor's goal is, and I support this. I don't know how the General Assembly will finally come out on it, but if we if it goes, if we were to adopt the budget that he introduced yesterday, we've had eight percent of our uh, uh, general fund spending in reserve, uh, and so that's probably a pretty good situation, better than most states, and we're backfilling. A shortfalls in our retirement uh, system, our retirement funds, and that's a uh, fiscally conservative uh, or responsible thing to do at this point. We also have enough money. If you want to move on into what happened yesterday in the governor's budget yesterday uh, to keep going, you know, we had to take our teacher raise back because of COVID. We're going to try. We're, we still have it in a bonus format in the governor's introduced, but we're going to try to figure out a way to make that an actual raise as we go as we go forward. You got to remember up in Northern Virginia, where we're listening to this uh, broadcast mostly, I suppose that um, it is it is considered to some an unfunded mandate when we give teachers raises because our LCI is uh, doesn't cover it. So the, the if Fairfax County would have to pay 67 percent of the raise. We pay for the other part of it because of the formula. So uh, I, we have uh, we've got that we're working on uh, getting back uh, funding into higher education and of course making up uh, ground on what I was talking about earlier before the, the break on our mental health substance abuse um, IDD uh, intellectual develop uh, you know intellectual development uh, issues. It's so easy to it's so easy to get into jargon on, yeah. on budget stuff. I mean yeah. it's a whole language that you have yeah. to learn. Yeah. Yeah, uh, developmental developmental disabilities, DD, developmental disabilities, and so um, we're we're working on all those things. Uh, plus, uh, we've got a lot of uh, uh, emphasis on workforce development. Workforce development is the key to growing the economy. People come here uh, not because of our low taxes or high taxes, but because we have a workforce that can that can be relied upon and trained and educated, and that's our whole card, really. To move into the future, and so we'll have a lot of emphasis on that early childhood yeah. education is part of that. So before we talk too much about those details, it's, it's an interesting point, and, and I hadn't really thought about it. But it's um, you talk about this rainy day fund, and I guess there's two sort of ways to to look at it, right? I mean, the way that it's actually set up and, and the legal setup of it is the rainy day that they that's contemplated is the day when when revenues go away, and, it, it, and we had that situation big time in the last recession, right? In 2008, 2009's recession, which really affected real estate on the other the other direction uh, where there was no money coming in. And so we saved that money in theory, that money set aside to keep meeting your expenditures. But what we're finding, I guess, with COVID and, and with this particular is it's because it's hitting so unevenly, um, as you said, I mean, a lot of folks just, you know, all it means is they're working at home and they need a second home office because they can just turn on their computers and go to work. But for a lot of people at the lower, uh, you know, people that work in restaurants and dishwashers and waiters and and some of the service employees um, that are hourly employees, they've been affected much more uh, acutely. And so the demand for services has gone up. 
but that's not the kind of rainy day that the rainy day fund really is is designed for. Michael, do you want to talk a little bit about um, how how, you, how the Commonwealth Institute is looking at this idea of is it is it raining or or not? You know, we can both look out the window and it, it seems pretty bad to a lot of folks out there. But you know. Talk a little bit about how uh, what Charles' approach to the reserves is and what you think some of the decisions uh, that the General Assembly has to make as far as that's concerned. Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, as you mentioned, what we're experiencing is what many economists are describing currently as a, a K-shaped, you know, economic recovery, if there is one right now, where folks at the top who have been able to transition to working from home, working remotely, are, are uh, doing quite well. Um, and big corporations, especially ones uh, uh, that um, have been able to transition their workforce that way. Uh, retailers, especially um, uh, that have strong online presence and the tech sector are, are booming while um, uh, so many uh, Virginians, um, in, especially in service sector jobs, uh, hospitality, uh, tourism, um, and others are, have been truly decimated. And so that I think is the the key challenge that uh, that all lawmakers are going to face in making choices around the budget this session is how to strike that balance to provide help to folks um, who are, are are struggling, even though some of the top line numbers um, can look uh, promising. And and as Delegate Sickles uh, mentioned, um, you know we have uh, we have these two funds um, in Virginia as uh, for for reserves and. Um, the rainy day fund, the revenue stabilization fund, is the 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 one that was established by a constitutional amendment and has strict rules about uh, when it can be accessed. And it's all about missing your forecast. And when your forecast is off by more than two percent, essentially, you can gain access to it in certain amounts in certain cycles. Um, but over during the um, uh, recovery from the Great Recession, uh, when we were struggling with um, budget challenges, the General Assembly created a second revenue reserve um, that uh, allows uh, the lawmakers to access those funds for those shortfalls that are less than 2% without um, so many of those uh, rules that were established in the constitutional language. And so um, I think the key question is sort of that you all are going to face when you uh, convene in January is, um, is uh, how much to put in reserves. The governor is proposing, you know, a $650 million additional deposit beyond the 161 that you all did in October. Um, and that balance about um, having the, the resources to make the investments we know are needed for rental assistance, you know, eviction help, healthcare, as Mark talked about, um, versus uh, the, the, uh, the need to have um, uh, you know, uh, solid reserves uh, to handle um, any future um, challenges, because I think we're in a very difficult moment with this pandemic. You know, I mean, it's really hopeful that the vaccine is coming out, but the current cases and the current economic constriction we've seen, the latest unemployment numbers in many parts of this country are really, really scary. And so I think striking that balance of what's needed for the immediate needs of the community, as well as how we have um, uh, deal with our reserves policy is going to be a big, a big question that you all will be dealing with come come session. Yeah, it's funny. My dad describes it. He he stole this from somebody, but yeah, it feels a little bit like where the the uh, if you watch the uh, Roadrunner cartoons when the coyote's chasing the Roadrunner, and you know the coyote goes off a cliff for a while, and before he he keeps moving before he realizes there's nothing underneath, and then he goes down. Mm -hmm. I know that there's a lot of folks that sort of have the fear that the economy is is sort of artificially the optimism is maybe a little unfounded, particularly the stock market and other places, and that. We may be in for, for worse economic times ahead yeah, still to come. Uh, so, Mark, tell us a little bit about um, what you think some of the highlights are from what the governor is proposing uh, on the spending side. I know we mentioned eviction relief. We're going to need more of that, um, trying to make our localities, particularly our school systems. Uh, you talk about the universities. What about, what about local governments? Is there anything in there for, for localities and, and local school boards and things like that? Because I know that localities have been really hit hard by the loss of meals tax revenue and some of the other revenues that they have. Yeah. Gone away. Well, the yeah, the primary thing to help local government, I believe, would be the um, backing up the school systems that have lost uh, membership. They lost, you know, right now the formula would take money away from local systems if they lost uh, students. Systems lost students, so he backfilled that with five hundred some million dollars. That's probably the main thing. As you mentioned earlier, this is the middle of a two-year budget, so we're. We're only making amendments to an underlying budget that fully funded 
the, uh, uh, the re-benchmarking uh, that we do every two years for education. And we, we fully funded the um, Medicaid, re the red Medicaid uh, re-forecast or forecast. And those two things are the biggest things in the budget. That never got unallotted uh, in April. So, um, so we're going to, we're adding strategically, I guess you could say, to the things that we tried to do and get back to what we did in March particularly on early childhood, on the, uh, the G3 program to have free and really reduced uh, cost community college education that's targeted to uh, when you get the degree, you actually have a job that's it's supposed to be really targeted to uh, things that we need to have in the marketplace right now. That's back in. Um, and on the COVID side, we've got $90 million in there for uh, distribution of the vaccine. Now, maybe the government will come by and give us some money uh, for that purpose, and then we can swap out so-called non-general funds with these general funds, this $90 million in the budget for distribution of the vaccine. Uh, he's he's uh, doing a lot of things for the COVID uh, response, and we've got $19 million in this budget for communications with the public, partly to assure them that the vaccine is safe and, and, and other the the problems that uh, not problems but the um, imperative that people continue to socially distance themselves from other people and keep a mask on we've got uh, money in there for or he does for three uh, three more epidemiologists for the department of health uh there's some we've got money for point prevalence testing in our mental health and other behavioral health institutions so to make sure that in, we're responsible for the people that are in our buildings, uh, we know when they have uh, come down or get infected with the virus and we can do uh, take uh, what the um, need, need of staff to do if that happens. We've got PPE money. Um, and so just, just taking care of the 1.5 or 6 million people that are in Medicaid that are our responsibility is really important. Um, so. Why is it our responsibility? I thought Medicaid was a federal program. What, what does that uh, have to do with it? Is, no, isn't this just free a, money we get from the, from the feds? No? Yeah, it's a federal partnership. In Virginia, as a richer state, we get a 50-50 a match. Some states get five to one match, like Mississippi. Uh, but uh, we're, we're at the maximum match. Of course, the expansion population, which were added uh, two years ago, um, that is a 90% match. And the hospitals are paying the extra 10% through a, uh, a provider's assessment. Uh, and so, so it's different, there's a little bit different cost share for children under our famous program, but it's, it's a part, it's a partnership. You know, if we can get people in good health till they're 65, then they go on Medicare and uh, their, their uh, health care is kind of taken care of federally, although Medicare has its own problems and right. um, uh, itself, but, so that's what we're trying to do with the partnership of the federal government. We have not taken up, as I mentioned earlier, we have not taken up the federal government on its offer to pay for half of everything you want to do. We have uh, 13,000 uh, children on a waiting list for services now that have intellectual disabilities or behind developmentally in some way. So that's uh, it's an interesting um, problem to have. Um, the uh, so, yeah, I mean, Medicaid, what's happening with the Medicaid population? Is the is COVID uh, and, and, and layoffs and, and job losses, are, is our Medicaid population growing, our 50% population? Yeah. You know, the population that, that we have a 50-50 match, right? Because I guess once you get below a certain level, they drop out of the expansion population and into straight Medicaid. Is that is that something that's cost us some money here in Virginia? Well, um, the, you, to be in Medicaid, you have to be under 138% of poverty. And if you're talking about uh, most of the people that expanded didn't have any type of health coverage before, so they would be treated as charity care. Um, so what what has really helped to have Medicaid expansion in the, in the COVID crisis is that when you walk into the hospital and you don't have insurance, if you are make if you're super poor uh, and make a less than 138 percent poverty, they can just sign you up there at the hospital. Um, you know, we have a lot of problems in the in the marketplace above that where you get subsidized insurance because even when it's subsidized, it's the uh, it's still expensive for a low income lower income worker. 
So there are a lot of people that could qualify for subsidized health care insurance that don't buy it because they can't afford the rent and uh, everything else they might have to pay for the medicine or whatever, you know. Um, and, and and so we lose some of that there. This is a problem that needs to be fixed at the federal level to put the cost sharing reductions back in that uh, were taken away during the Trump administration to make it more affordable for people in that that qualified the under 400% of poverty to buy ins subsidized insurance on the exchange. So, uh, but to answer your question, I think there's a hundred and last time I saw Michael, you may have a better number, but we had 125,000, maybe must be more than that now of people who lost their job because of COVID who have, right. have, have been able to get insurance because of our expansion program. Right. I'm often, I often wonder, what happens in Florida and Texas to the biggest states in the country that have not expanded Medicaid and how they're handling the same population of people who lower income but essential workers that have lost their job in uh, hospitality, travel industries, uh, uh, restaurant industry, and, and they don't have Medicaid expansion in those two states. So the hospital says, you know, there's all kinds of cross subsidies in our health care system. Uh, things cost more than they do to pay for people who can't pay at all. And I guess that's what they must do in Texas and Florida to a, max, you know, a large degree. Yeah. It's helped us the a other, lot. Yeah. The other thing, um, Marcus, especially as it connects to the state budget, is um, there uh, was an, an increase, a temporary increase to the federal match rates that Mark has been mentioning as part of the federal uh, legislation that has passed. And so, uh, for example, in the Medicaid reforecast, that's part of the governor's budget that he introduced, uh, includes uh, booking those savings to the tune of about $250 million, because during a periods of recessions, one of the ways that the feds can help states out is to boost that federal match rate that they typically provide for Medicaid. And there has been that enhanced map uh, federal match has has been part of this. That is, and then also we've been um, able to expand what's called emergency Medicaid. So helping folks, as Mark said, who are coming through the doors of hospitals and clinics uh, who might not otherwise uh, be eligible for coverage because of some uh, uh, issue, uh, to actually be able to get them get them coverage. And those those things have been so incredibly valuable for folks in our community to meet the challenges of the pandemic. Sure. So for either one of you, you know, one of the great products we were talking about earlier, Mark, was the uh, one of the great things that the Commonwealth Institute does is they put out side by sides uh, where we can sort of compare budgets. And we we're talking about in the process, you know, the, the chair of appropriations in the House, uh, uh, Delegate Torian, you know, introduces the governor's amendments as his budget bill, but that runs through the House appropriations. But the Senate now, and this wasn't always the case, but it's been this way for, for as long as I've been in the legislature, they also go on a parallel track and they do their own uh, through Senate. Now they've even changed the name of their committee from finance to appropriations and finance. And Senator Howell, who's also from Fairfax, is the chair of that. Where do you expect, if anywhere, and, and I know we're sort of guessing because it's early in the process, do you expect there to be any, and it's for either one of you, um, any differences between the House and the Senate approach? Have we heard anything? Are there any hints that we've gotten, any, any tea leaves that we can read to, to see where the House and the Senate might take a, a different approach on the budget? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that yet. On the big picture, we're pretty aligned on the big picture, what we want to do in K-12 and in healthcare. But on some of the specifics, we have a different approach or might have differences of opinion. You know, I could mention a few of them, but they are seriously in the weeds. And like the new radio <laughs> system for the, um, the state police, how to handle procurement of the new, very expensive uh, STARS radio system in the police. About uh, the Senate has a uh, a program that uh, we reluctantly agreed to to, to uh, hit the hospitals on over uh, using the emergency room too frequently. The hospitals are big on trying to get rid of that now. That's in the budget. That might be an issue. Um, we we have differences a little bit on uh, approach to higher education. That the uh, House up to this point has been more willing to put more money in to keep the cost of college down so kids. Uh, won't have to borrow as much money. The Senate wants to, you know, almost give their, I don't want to say total, but the emphasis on more financial aid. The uh, House has believed over the years that if you, there, there's no incentive to keep tuition down, if you can just borrow more money, we're trying to keep the kids from graduating without too much debt. And uh, 
and uh, the college presidents like the flexibility of having more financial aid so they can keep the you know folks coming in so that's a little bit of an issue we we had a nice compromise on that uh in this current budget that we're in but that's that's a small difference in because we're both trying to do better for higher education just have a slightly different approach to it things like that but i think this one i think this uh second year or mid-year budget we have here we call it a budget it's not really a budget it's amendments to the budget as you were mentioning and i think this will be easier to work out i don't see any huge uh, problems but i don't i haven't studied it all yet so there could be something yeah. The only thing I would mention, Marcus, um, just to put a pin in it is, um, you know, with the Biden administration coming in, um, hopefully there will be another package um, in the new administration. Um, you know, obviously Congress is is, uh, is very much up in the air, especially with the races in Georgia and the tight margins for the Democrats, even in the House. Uh, but I think uh, the timing of getting um, uh, the General Assembly being able to get their hands around what, if anything, Congress is going to do, because it is a short session, um, especially in providing additional federal relief in some of these areas. That bedeviled us um, when the Obama administration first came in. Um, the federal stimulus uh, was enacted like in the closing days of our session. And so uh, lawmakers had to scramble very quickly to, to fold that stuff into the budget. And so uh, we just got to watch this space for if there is, if, if Congress does actually start acting in the new Biden administration and gets a package passed, um, you know, because we have the short session, there'll be some pieces of that that we just got to kind of very much keep our eye on the ball. Because as Mark said, there's pieces in the governor's budget that are putting state general fund dollars to do stuff that uh, like, uh, uh, you know, getting widespread uh, 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 processing of the vaccine distribution uh, that that could very well be federal things coming in. So that's an area that we'll all have to just keep our eye on that space. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, you know, we have the misfortune right in that state of not being able to print money, at least we haven't, you know, since 1860 or so, right? So um, because I get a lot of constituents that are like, why you guys should, you know, you should replace the, the stimulus, you should do your own stimulus payment. We should just send people checks for you know, for 15, you know, why don't we do UBI on a state level? Like, well, we can't do universal basic income at the state. We, we're constrained and it's not just a balanced budget amendment. It's, it's, it's the fact that we just literally can't print our own money. So, um, you know, it's, it's a bit of a different uh, animal. Well, listen, I want to thank you both for being here, for letting us know what's going on. Um, we are uh, running up against the clock here. Uh, but I want to thank um, my good friend, Delegate Mark Sickles, who's our vice chair. He's really, guys, Mark is, is a super legislator. Um, he, he's a chairman, a, a committee chairman. He's a vice chairman. He's the ranking member on a number of committees. Uh, if anybody ever has a bill, they really want to make sure it passes. They try and give it to Mark to do because he usually gets things done. Um, <laughs> well, and I want to thank you, Michael, for, for being there. Uh, you really, your half sheet, it's a great tool for legislators like me who aren't on the money committees to help understand what's going on. And I encourage uh, viewers out there to visit uh, your website and check out the halfsheet.org for your blog and follow you on Twitter uh, and really get sort of a, a plain language explanation of, of some of the decision points uh, between the various versions of the state budget that are out there. So thank you very much. Uh, this has been the final 2020 edition of the Inside Scoop. I've been your host, Marcus Simon. Look forward to seeing you all in the new year.